Welcome everyone. Thanks to all participants today and to our sponsor area, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. The Asian Network is a digital community of 400 plus thought, business and young leaders supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with our webinar series and conference. For our webinar today, we are happy to have an exclusive panel of female speakers from Singapore, Cambodia and Mongolia in line with our next virtual conference on October 7 named Women and Leadership 4.0 from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Hong Kong time in partnership with AREA. We will share with you the link in the chat box. Today's webinar, Tech for Good, is related to agriculture and technology. At the end, we will have a Q&A session so please feel free to write your question in the chat box. Let me introduce you now to our first speaker. Jolene is a 24 years old founder and CEO of Urban Tiller, which is dedicated to its mission of reimagining what generation food supply chains can look like in cities. Urban Tiller is Asia's first integrated farm-to-table attic startup that delivers fresh products within eight hours of harvest. They currently operate in Singapore and Hyderabad, India. Jolene is also graduated from NUSC College and was featured in Harvard Bazaar Singapore List 2021 Sustainability Champion in Singapore. Welcome Jolene. The floor is yours. Hi guys, uh, nice to meet you guys. Thank you Ravindra for the invitation. It's really good to be here today. Uh, just to share a little bit more about what we're doing here at Urban Tiller. Uh, so Urban Tiller was something that I founded earlier last year in August 2020. Um, and we've since sort of uh, run this in Singapore for the past one year. And we've also launched in Hyderabad in December 2020. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quite quickly as I sort of tell you a little bit more about what I've been up to. Chrome tab. Um, cool. Um, if you can see my screen, this should be good. Let me see if I can fit this and make it full screen. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. So here at Urban Tiller, you know, um, you know, the team is in Singapore and in Hyderabad, India. Um, and what we do at Urban Tiller is really trying to work towards a vision where we see the future of fresh food is hyper local and ultra fresh. Um, you know, I, I would urge you guys to think about for all of us who live in cities, uh, when was the last time we went to the supermarket and bought some fresh food, salad, leafy greens, um, but never really asked ourselves, what is freshness or, or how fresh is your food? Right. And I think uh, this really leads into a larger conversation of the time that I've spent in the agri-food sector, especially thinking about agri-food supply chains. So for me, I really got into the industry by accident. Um, I was running a different startup uh, last year during COVID, and uh, we were focusing on educational opportunities for young people who are transitioning into the working world. Uh, we saw an opportunity to provide people with real life industry um, experiences to actually think about what sustainability and social impact would look like. So yes, last year was the year of food and agri-tech. Um, and what we did and what I did was also with my co-founders managed to speak to many different players in the agri-food industry, uh, from VCs to farmers to big agri-business. Um, and by the end of that process, I had met uh, my new business partner um, and also thought about what I wanted to do in the space. And a huge thing that we saw was that a lot of farmers were actually dealing with fresh food. In Singapore, you may or may not know that in 2019, we launched a national initiative called the 30 by 30. Uh, 30 by 30 refers to Singapore producing 30% of its nutritional needs locally by the year 2030. And for some context, you know, in Singapore, we import more than 90% of our food, so less than 10% is actually produced locally. Um, all of this has led to a frenzy of uh, the prolifer proliferation of urban farms. It has also led to, you know, a lot of uh, cell-based protein, alternative protein, um, and the baskets really focus on producing eggs, fish, and leafy greens in Singapore. So diving a little bit deeper into the problem, what we realized was that uh, current food supply chains generally cause a few problems, especially in cities. Uh, one is that, you know, 
uh, fresh food when it comes from a faraway place has spent a lot of time on the supply chain and there is actually a loss in quality, right? So what happens is really that farmers who are growing, let's say, fresh lettuce, bok choy or anything like that um, in rural farmlands overseas actually ship that across into consumption centers. Um, because leafy greens are so perishable, there's actually about 50 to 90 percent of that nutritional content that's lost within the first 24 hours product, uh, of harvest. And, you know, along that supply chain, about 40 to 70 percent of food waste is actually caused as well due to a lack of proper handling, lack of proper cold chain or packaging damages. So in essence, what's happening here is that uh, the cost of nutritional loss and wastage is actually being transferred onto the consumer, while farmers are actually getting a much harder time uh, to make fair returns for their fresh produce, um, especially if they're far away from consumption centers, which is really what the current supply chain looks like. Um, especially for cities like Singapore and major tier one cities across the region. So a lot of what we think about when it comes to food is that there is also a concurrent um, setting up and proliferation of urban farms and smart farming technology. Um, but our team really sees that smart farming technology and modern farming needs to be coupled up with a brand new supply chain and business model for farmers to actually be able to make a profit and to prosper. Uh, what we see is that hopefully the fresh food future lies in growing our fresh food closer to cities so that cities and consumption centers can actually eat more locally. Um, and this reduces food waste, food miles and unnecessary costs that may be incurred through distributors, middlemen, logistics partners. Um, and all of that also to deliver maximum nutrition and freshness to the customer. And when we do have direct ex uh, access to the customer, you're actually able to perform robust demand aggregation, market retention and and understanding what customers are looking for. And I'll just about the sustainability of these farming methods. Actually able to save up to 90% of water, but also traditional soil farming can then be reserved for quality crops that are not time dependent, um, like staples, grains, nuts and tubers, where the farmers don't actually lose out as much when their produce is being shipped along supply chains into consumption centres. Right? So why are we not doing this now? So I would just zoom in a little bit on um, how Singapore looks like right now and a lot of tier one cities are seeing a proliferation or, you know, many urban farms coming up, right? Small urban farms, small to medium sized urban farms generally start with about one to five kinds of produce that they grow on their farm uh, when they are starting up. And a lot of these farms actually need to learn how to grow the crop that they would like to sell. All of this includes a high cost of setting up the farm and infrastructure. So this is a lot of the concerns that the farmers might be having now. A lot of people start up farms also thinking that they would go back into the traditional supply chains where you supply to retail and to supermarkets. Um, and a lot of this stuff is actually uh, really interesting because when you think about how urban farms are actually trying to sell to supermarkets, you have a consignment model that's actually very, very challenging for them. So what I mean by consignment is basically that a farmer might be required to stock the shelves with 10 kilos of vegetables every day, but supermarkets will actually pay you for what's been sold. So imagine with a perishable item like fresh vegetables, uh, what happens is that if you sell two kilos and pay the farmer for that, you have eight kilos of produce that are effectively wasted. Um, unlike things like seafood or, you know, more, more valuable items, people might spend some uh, time to actually process the unsold product into another pro uh, item. But with leafy greens, you really can't do that a lot of the time. Um, so when urban farms face that problem of the difficulty of supplying to supermarkets, uh, given the consistency and the volume, they might actually decide to go directly to customers on their own, set up their own web store. What happens very quickly is also they realize that customers are not coming back to them. And that's because they only have lettuce and kale, right? So what to choose from. Um, and when you do only have one or two kinds of produce, what happens is also that customers might feel as if they would go to the supermarket to buy everything else anyway, so they wouldn't make an extra step to actually sort of come back to you and, and buy that just two items that uh, they appreciate from your farm. So a lot of this stuff actually helped us see that we needed an aggregated facility um, and an assortment that we could offer the, the people um, and, and our customers uh, to actually understand what's actually growing in the market, what customers are looking for, what, what, the, what they're willing to pay for and what they want to buy. Um, and this gives us the market intelligence to actually inform the farms um, to help them grow things that will make them profitable um, and also to improve their farming systems so that they can actually get a, a better share of the market given what they're able to grow. 
So looking at this, what Urban Tiller is really trying to do is that we take from the farmers and we deliver to the customers within the same day, within eight hours of harvest. It's an end-to-end -end business model with a two-type supply chain. End-to-end -end because we basically are fostering a network of urban farms to actually grow a full assortment of what we want. Um, given with urban farming is doing, we generally see a lot of farms trying to grow things like lettuce, trying to grow things like kale. Uh, what we're trying to do is a lot of my work day to day actually is lobbying and talking to farmers and going like, hey, you know, we noticed that there's a lot of this stuff growing in the market. We could actually shift to growing something else. There's a huge demand for, but not many farms growing. And you could actually make a better profit that way. Um, if you need to learn how to grow this stuff, Urban Tiller is also your farming partner to actually come and help you uh, learn how to do this. So uh, as Urban Tiller, we generally fa deploy farming assets where we need to, uh, although still trying to keep to a very lean model right now as a small team. Um, in between, we have a logistics and live inventory model to keep our prices low, reduce waste, and of course, deliver the best customer experience, coupled by that demand-driven, um, you know, aggregation uh, data and understanding how we can actually get to the best pricing models while we diversify the portfolio and uh, assortment for our customers as well. Um, so, you know, an interesting metric is actually thinking about how much a traditional farmer is making from what the customer pays, right? Farm prices are what farmers get paid for their produce. So for a kilogram of, let's say, baby spinach, right, in the last row, uh, the farmers are actually only getting 25% of what the final customer is paying at the supermarket. With Urban Tiller, that's actually doubled. They get paid half, they get paid half of that because we've removed all the middlemen and we're actually able to actually increase their profits because we have you know, um, implemented a price system which actually helps customers appreciate both an extre um, ex extremely fresh product, right? Value-added product, value-added service, um, and being able to connect the farm-to-table supply chain very, very seamlessly. So just before I leave, um, you know, the farm-to-table value chain for us is really being able to grow, move, and delight the customers, um, being able to see how this can be a plug-and-play model in different cities. We hope to be expanding to different cities over the next few years. Um, and that's always exciting when we think about uh, which cities actually have different farming models, um, what the market looks like, what customers are looking for, and being able to manage that demand aggregation for the farmers. Because so far, at least in Singapore, what we what we know is that farmers always love when they're not connected to the market. Um, and at the mercy of supermarket uh, value chains, especially. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell what Urban Tiller looks like. You know, we launched in Singapore, we launched in Hyderabad. Um, we've managed to, you know, build a team that really, really commits themselves to a very high quality delivery experience. Um, if you'd like to find out more, uh, you can always get in touch with me. You can follow us on Urban Tiller on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and that's my email if you'd like to get in touch with me as well. So open to any questions and really excited to hear what Chimka and um, Shailen would love to share about their startups as well. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you. Your bank is by super fresh local produce from small to medium sized local farmers who don't really benefit from the supermarket system. I'm happy now to introduce you to our second guest speaker coming from Cambodia. Srili Meng is a co-founder of Smart Farm Assistant. She founded Smart Farm Assistant in 2019, which is focusing on smart irrigation for water management by using IoT for remote control. She got several awards, such as Cambodia ICT Award, Best R&D 2020, and she loves Tech Cambodia Award, among others. She's passionate about technology for a better change and enjoy being part of Problem Solvers. Welcome, Srilin. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ravindra, for a um, very well introduction for myself. Um, I'm from Cambodia again, and then a representative of um, Smart Farm Assistance that we doing related to Internet of Things for uh, remote control and what our goal is to be um, a smart management so smart farm management. So the first things that we focusing on is about the smart education. So I'm very excited to share um, with all of you here and also the Asian people to know about uh, us from Cambodia. So well, I'm going to share my pres uh, presentation. Okay, um, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can everyone see it well? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, again, 
Um, we are smart farm assistant, and we believe that agritech is our future. So the story today is very fit with us. And um, what um, we are found in 2019, 2019 that uh, we innovate the technology, especially Internet of Things for smart farm management. But the, currently, we are focusing on the smart education, which is to remote control the education by the mobile application to have the farmer to have a better decision um, on education. So well, uh, as you will know that farmers always do um, um, farming by their manually. They have a lot of activities, spend a lot of time and very traditional. And due to climate change, they very hard to um, do a farming. Most important thing about their um, productivity that's a little bit low. So in Cambodia, we we are in a, in the stage that we have to improve with the technology, especially with our um, farmers, and then also the farmers. Um, we our GDP is really rely on with the um, agriculture. So the things that uh, we are the team passionate with technology and especially with my background of e-commerce, with my team with background of electronic engineering. So we think that one of the uh, better change is to involve with the technology for the agriculture. And we want um, our mission is to transform digital, um, sorry, trans, um, transform traditional ed education to smart education that 60% of Cambodian farmers can access at affordable price in the next three years. Um, and, and yeah, our vision is to uh, solve farm management problem by using technology that equipment on the ground inform decision making all managed from the cloud platform. So that's it, the things that we, we want to uh, think about the, the big thing related to uh, farm management, not only um, education, it's just a part. So the core problem, we just um, choose the easy to understand and the easy way to uh, define the problem of the farmer facing related to agriculture. So the first thing is about excessive water waste that farmers, um, farmer farmer, they do the irrigation by manually. As you see, they have to spend a lot of what um, waters, um, waste of waters, and then um, there is no control. Some, some of farmers, they forget to turn off or switch off the water. So the, the water also wastes as well. And the second point is about education is primarily performed by manual labor. So what I think, what I can see in Cambodia, you know, like uh, one day that I go to meet a farmer for the first time in my life, that I never think that farmers are very hard for working. So everyone are doing in manual and then they have to have a big team for, um, for farming. So that is the pain point for um, our farmer. And the last, and the, the, the last one is less than optimal crop yield. So as you know that uh, plants need a lot of water, plants need a proper water, but there is no, um, there is no, the, uh, the one thing is that we can have a good decision and the tracking of water that we can prove our yield. Sometimes it over water, water, and sometimes it less water. So it's also affect to the yield as well, right? So that, um, this is the three things that I think that is very important for irrigations to be have a, a proper irrigation to our plant. So with our solution, smart farm assistance that we um, provide the smart education platform, utilizing smart walls and palm and data analysis software to regulate water distribution, remote monitorings and data driven crop yield optimization. So we have two products. Um, this is the detail how it look like. Um, so we have a smart wall, smart pump that's smart, smart pump that's connected with a motor pump, mostly in the farms that we need to have a motor pump to um, distribute water, right, from the pond. So, and then farmer uh, can remote control, just switch on and off, on and off from the bottom and also with um, the set the duration and set time duration of irrigation, or they can be a schedule as well. Sorry. And we also have a history, show the history of daily education, which is how, how long they need to spend for education and how much is it with the sensors that show the humidity, uh, the level of humidity, the level of temperatures and water meter. So it's with the in the integration together with sensors and the, the um, IoT device with the solenoid with the mod uh, controller, we can um, control the irrigation through the mobile application with a, a quite great. So that is how, and one of the things that um, we are 
currently, um, we also have a language, my language for our farmer in Cambodia because, um, our farmers really like of, uh, in English language. So we, we try to, um, double in Khmer. So, well, uh, we also got some, um, the model that we can get a profit is to sell the, fa- the hardware or the device, um, our smart farm assistant to the farmers and also provide the installations. And the third is about subscription. And last is about the, yep, maintenance and, 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 and sit. And that's it. Okay. Uh, so we think that the farmers that c- quite fit with us is related to vegetable that some of farmers have a small vegetable. Some of farmers in, um, have a big farmers and also in, some of farmers in Cambodia, we have mostly is vegetable farmer. And we do have a greenhouse and also fruit farms that we can um, export to other countries. And last, we also want to um, sell it to other stores as well. So with our value provision that we can have for the farmers, that is the first thing is about water saving. That they can save between 20% to um, 30% in a month. And also they can save more time, more than three hours per day, which is like one um, hectare for farmers. If they are going to do a manual allocation, they have to spend absolutely two or three hours. So imagine that they just saving time by remotely control the application. So it very saving time, right? Okay, also increase the yield from 20% as well, and also can sell in the course, which is like 200, um, 200 per month. Okay. And yes, uh, we have piloting with this, um, amount of province. We have learned a lot with from the, um, very ideation, ideation state to prototype and also to piloting and also can, um, can sell with some of farmers. So we can, um, install for food farm, vegetable garden, and generally farm. So our plan is to finish the sensors and also the re- device that can control remote um, education. In 2020, we also think about the data that analysis platform to have and identify the process um, for the farmer as well. Of course, we some we have some award from. Ministry of Sports and Telecom, which is the best R and D or research and development uh, research and development awards of the year, and we also apply some occupation, some competition to learn how how the startup uh, works and also um, how how to improve ourselves. Well, because this is my first time to leading the startup, so it's go to learn from other competition. It look it's go to learn from the program. So. That's, I, I think that is all about me and thank you everyone for um, pay attention about my presentation. Thank you and hope to see the question next. Thank you. Thanks Regine for sharing how smart farm assistant in Cambodia will allow farmers to control their water systems remotely, monitor mm-hmm. humidity and also check soil data through a few simple taps on, 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 on phone. We are happy uh, to welcome now our last speaker from Mongolia. Shinka yes. has a professional experience in the field of social enterprise, human rights, and education. In October 2020, with her team, she won the Call for Code Global Challenge, supported by IBM. Co-founder of Agroli, she has also founded the company Nomads Agritech Innovation, based in Mongolia to solve social economic issues in rural Mongolia with a combination of agriculture and entrepreneurship. Thanks for being there, Shimka. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Shimka and I'm currently in Mongolia, but I think uh, some of you may be in the same time zone. I'm uh, well, quite in Asia zone, <laughs> all of us. Um, so um, let me share my screen uh, to talk about like what I'm actually doing. Okay. This one. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen very well? Okay. That's perfect. Okay, so um, I'm introducing Agroly Mongolia. We are family farmers assistant app. 
Um, so I think uh, like we all talk about a lot of about the, what's happening, the food crisis in the world. Why? So like, I think it's repetitive to talk about. So like, I'm just gonna skip to like what the situation is in Mongolia in agriculture. So Mongolia supplies like 55% of the vegetable consumption from the local farmers, but the 45% is from imports. Uh, and, uh, like prices, like usually when, when those imported, uh, products are sold to customers, like prices, like highly increased. For example, like price of the imported vegetables is increased by 85% when it's sold to end consumers. And also, uh, so far, there are a lot of middlemen working in Mongolia. So like they buy the, the local vegetables from farmers and sell it to end consumers, then the, the price increases average by 200%. So uh, we thought like it's a big crisis because the middlemen are like, they're usually winning in the game, but the end consumers and then also farmers are losing their uh, chance to be connected effectively and to get a win-win decision. So there are like 35 family uh, farmers and big farmers and small farmers, 35,000 farmers in Mongolia and 480 cooperatives operating in Mongolia, but they have a huge problem. Like what problem they're having is like, according to our research, the family farmers, they have to deal with uh, because of the harsh weather condition, they have to fight against the climate change. And then they don't have basically no affordable loans or investments. And they don't have uh, integrated data source for farming because agriculture is like usually not really well digitized or not really well integrated with technology. So also like after just like producing the, the local produce, basically there's no market, well-established market to sell their produce. And then because it's not really lucrative industry. So a lot of young people, they give up the farming jobs. Um, but on the other hand, like they're agricultural farming ex experts uh, working in the local regions, but they also have some problems, even though they have some funds or they have support from the government, they still have to work with uh, uh, simultaneously with many different regions at the same time. For example, if you're an agronomist in a certain region and you have to work with 17 different regions, like you cannot really travel all of them within three months or especially the, during the time that the disease is very common, you cannot really travel all of the farmers and meet them and advise them. Uh, and then also like in Mongolia, it's very common that uh, a lot of reports are manually collected. Like basically, if you're a local expert that you, uh, you're you working with the government, you have to ask every uh, single record keeping of families and then also put it into Excel format. And then that's how you can submit to the ministry and also like statistics uh, center. Uh, but it's like they usually it's because of the manual process, like there could be a lot of uh, mistakes in the data. So data could not be that credible for the analysis later. Um, and then also, like if you're a local agronomist who are working with many from family um, farmers, there's no integrated platform like to distribute, like how you can advise them, like to avoid the disease and pest or like if there is a certain natural disaster is coming, like how can you just help the farmers to prevent? There's no um, single platform that is like integrated and helping the farmers in Mongolia. And then also, of course, like the, the, the most important thing is like, how can you deliver the substantial or financial support to the farmers, farmers, but for agronomists itself, like themselves, it's like it's almost impossible to help them financially because there's no mark well established uh, market ecosystem for e-commerce for which double, for example. And then of course there's a lack lack of workforce. Like in recent years, like a lot of young people are not really getting into the agriculture sector. But at the same same time, like consumers like me, like I like if I go out, like I'm not able to find like locally grown healthy witch double. And then even if I find one, like the, the price is quite high and I don't know why. Um, and then also like there's no guarantee on the food safety. For example, if you want to trace like certain witch doubles and then you want to know like where it came from and then how it was actually grown. Like I want to know this kind of uh, stuff like as a young consumer, but like uh, in many countries, it's very lacking um, solution. And then also, of course, like there's a lack of information providing platform, like a lot of consumers in developing countries, they don't know why they have to buy the locally grown witch doubles, because sometimes imported witch doubles are quite cheap. And then I don't know what is the difference between locally grown one and an imported witch doubles. 
So like to solve all these issues, we came up with this uh, mobile application called Agrily. So through Agrily, we're basically um, basically solving a lot of challenges faced by different stakeholders. But usually for farmers, we are providing short and long-term weather forecast. For example, we divided the whole Mongolia's map like 740 points like every 555 kilometers we wanted to show the one year ahead prediction for the farmers so that they can effectively plan their um crop management and then our weather is like pretty uh our weather forecast is pretty credible because we collected like last 80 years of weather history every single regions and location so every 55 kilometers based on their last 80 years weather history we are predicting one year ahead of um ahead of the weather so that the the farming can be the effectively planned by family farmers um, and then also like we wanted to provide the integrated crop data source like if you just go into our app and then you just search for any vegetable like tomato uh, from preparing the soil to the storage we are every single steps we are just teaching them how to do it the process it's very useful for uh, newly coming uh, farmers and then also like of course we are digitizing the record keeping like every single data will be saved in the app and later you can just ask your local agronomist to download your report so like you don't have to really uh, worry about like what kind of report you're going to submit and also of course we are um providing the networking like every single farmers from different regions they can network they can ask uh, any questions from each other or they can just like run the free discussions through our app and then also like every digital um, registration process like now like everything is manually like, you have to ask the government like if you want to uh, do the farming but like this registration process can be digitized so like that we um, just integrated the process so if you are a farmer in Mongolia you want to start you are a very new farmer and you want to start the official farming you can just register the entire process through our app so that can be connected to your local economists um, the most importantly we're trying to build the e-commerce for which double for example like you can you can be anyone you can be farmer you can be consumer but either way you can just download the app and then if you're a consumer you if you download the app you can see the entire um the list of the which tables locally grown which tables are sold through our app then you can make an order and you can even trace your um trace your product of where it came from maybe it's from the eastern part or western part like either way you can trace entire product and then also we have like bunch of experts who are providing their service to the uh, rural family farmers uh, so Agroly is not only uh, implemented in Mongolia Agroly is a quite global solution so uh, we you made the first pilot in eastern Mongolia 50 to 60 farmers last year and then also uh, after winning the call for code uh, we started making tailored apps in Mongolia Brazil and India and then also like our app is some is not something that we did it it we just talked to a lot of farmers and we integrated their voice um so as uh as previously mentioned we uh won the call for code 2020 grand prize uh competing against 400,000 developers from 179 nations so we are fully uh, working with ibm uh, a service corps like uh, developing the open source solution on Agroly. So for Agroly Mongolia, uh, as I said, like we just started developing the tailored app uh, be very beginning of this year, and then we launched that on June 15. And now we have um, uh, 1,200 farmers, and then uh, the active users are we have like more than 1,000, but still we are just building the very last version, which is pretty much developed the e-commerce part. And this is our global team. Uh, I'm from Mongolia and we have uh, members from Brazil, India and Taiwan. And then that's how we just uh, 
a came up solution and tested in Mongolia first. And then, then we just uh, tested our app in Brazil and India. And then now we are working with IBM company to develop the open source technology. Uh, this is our Mongolia team. Like we thought like there should be have like, there should be some in-house team because the like, Mongolian people, they know the market, they know the solution more. And then that's how just like we came up with the local teams. We have local team in Mongolia. We have local team in Brazil and India as well. Uh, and then this is pretty much about us. Like if you want to know more, like you can see like www.agroly.mm. Uh, that is more about Agroly Mongolia. But if you search for Agroly, you can also uh, look for our um, global solution and what we are doing at the global level and uh, also like local levels as well. So thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoyed my presentation. Thanks, Mika. I'm proud to see Agroli provided hands-on training to rural farmers across Brazil, India, and Mongolia. So now it's uh, time to for our Q&A session. Uh, I may uh, um, we we have one question from our particip participant Winston, which is very uh, close to my first question: How agritech innovation can improve and transform the ecosystem for small farmers in Asia. Who want to answer first? Perhaps um, Srilin? You need to unmute yourself. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's that's a very nice question. How agritech innovation can improve and transform the ecosystem for small, for small farmer in Asia? So, I think that digital is very important for every sector and mostly um, I think one of part is agriculture that we can connect, we can get information, access with the information, we can um, improve the productivity so uh, it's have a good for farmers and also some of the um, help for the data that can tracking for activity. So this is all reflect to the ecosystems that we can connect with the government. We can connect with the agriculture uh, farmers, which is like um, it's it's not only about the about the IoT, but it's also the information accessible and also sharing the information and also the market. Um, we have an e-commerce platform, and then we can um, import and export our. Um, um, plants and also vegetable to everywhere. And also this ecosystem, I think that is very close if um, our team, oh no, I mean that um, is the young generation, they are having a uh, high knowledge and also create a lot of innovations and they can bring the agriculture on board and also uh, have a lot of activity improvement. And I think that it, this ecosystem is can be connected with other startups around the world and as I see that um, uh, the Groly is very, Agroly is very interesting that um, she collaborate with many countries and she collaborate with um, a good uh, founder. So that is the things that we not only uh, bring the technology helping our uh, country, but we can um, transform and help, uh, make this ecosystem very closely. So these are the short things that I think uh, innovation of agriculture is very important. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rilin. Perhaps, uh, Jolene, uh, a thought on that? Yeah, no, I think what Sherilyn said was very uh, on point. Uh, one of the extra things that we see is also, um, I think there's there's a slight split between what happens with farmers who are in cities, uh, who are dealing with very high costs of production and labor and farming, versus uh, farmers who are actually smallholder outside of cities and are actually doing traditional farming. Um, and I think it's a very interesting conversation to have because when you think about how the right tech for the right kind of props um, need to exist in balance, uh, not not just when it comes to cost, but also when it comes to providing the best experience for the farmers and the customers as well. So, for example, in Singapore, you actually see a lot of new um, urban farmers who are using hydroponic systems who actually are still using the seeds and the expertise from, you know, uh, what you think is going to be the same as growing at home or growing in soil in an open field. Um, in which case, it actually causes a lot of teething issues when you're actually starting a new farm that's using technology. Um, and to me, that's not just a matter of, 
using the right tech, but also how do you help people transition between tech um, and what kind of research for support you're actually able to provide? Because, um, you know, one of our advisors at Urban Tiller, he's an expert when it comes to adapting plants for indoor agriculture, for controlled environment farming. Um, and this matters a lot because smallholder farmers don't just exist um, in, in an in, in, in a vacuum, right? You have people who are trying to scale up farming operations. Um, and while urban farming is very exciting to produce a huge amount of food for a lot of people, um, there's still an innovation and technology adoption curve that you need to take on. Um, so, for example, in Urban Tiller, India, where we have um, about six acres of farmland, a lot of it is really finding a sweet spot between how do you produce crops in controlled environment that are good quality, traceable, safe, uh, but you're able to then adapt that technology to grow uh, uh, all the crops that you want at a suitable price point for customers as well. Um, and I think a lot of it is thinking about when we work with farmers at Urban Tiller, we work with, you know, aggregation, we work with uh, farming expertise and consultancy. A lot of it is that farmers don't have up, uh, as both Shailen and, and um, Chimka pointed out, like no financial ability to adapt systems overnight. So I think it's always about having a good working relationship to uh, adopt right appropriate technology by having on the ground operations and understanding what they're actually doing, um, as opposed to trying to sell them because some startups do this, right? Like, as opposed to trying to say that here's a fully formed product, here's technology, here have it, right? And you can buy it from me, you can pay me for it. But I think there's there's always a big gap in trying to understand what the farmers actually need um, and how you can run that operation uh, suited to the farm, not suited to your product, but suited to the farmer as well. Yeah. Thanks, Julian, uh, for your analysis. Perhaps, uh, Shinka, some insights? Yeah, I... Thank you. I think Srilin, Julian, uh, they just both like, uh, they just all touched the parts, but I think, um, like for the adoption, like we see a lot of challenges because, for example, Mongolia farmers today, their just average age is like 50 years old. So like we to, uh, to help, we have to help them to adopt the mobile app, for example, like they have like smart, smartphone usages growing constantly, but like at the same time, they're struggling with the different platforms, for example, Facebook, or just like the next one is Agroly. So like we are having a lot of trips, field trips, and then we are preparing a lot of brochures and videos, like to, tr to help the farmers to understand how it works and then how they can use. So I think that's also important part to help them to adopt the new technologies. And then of course, like, in the future, the upcoming farmers will be younger and then it's going to be easier with them. But like the current one is like it's not going to happen overnight. But so we have to do a lot of things, the trainings and then stuff like that. So that, that's the, under that situation, I think it's more possible. Thank you. Thank you, Shinka. So, so um, uh, I, I found a question uh, from Sangeta uh, for uh, Shredin. She asked, when you develop the tech, it is crucial to select the right technology. Most of the farmers in developing countries don't have so much knowledge about technology. So yes. how you how you tackle this challenge? That's, that's very nice. It's really hit the point. <laughs> uh, in Cambodia, we, have, uh, we are the developing countries and then... Um, we have some of challenge with the infrastructure and also the networks, like um, the access with the internet, access with the uh, telecom in the province is very hard. And also with the, um, the farmers, we have low education. Some of the, um, some of them are elders, and then uh, most of them really um, hard for changing their habits. So the things that we have start with the technology. Um, that we, we reflect with the activities that uh, my, my team, he have an, a families and then they are a farmers and then we going to meet the farmer as well. And what is the main activity they holding, they holding every day and what is they have to, um, input activity. So we think that education is a part of everything that, uh, for the plan. And then when I introduce the technology, I just introduced that if imagine, I ask the farmers, imagine in one day that um, we are young teenagers, we can bring some technology that can remote control. How do you feel? And do you think that is a, a challenge or it's hard to moving on? So this is the first day that we have a survey with the farmers. So I think um, in, in 10 people, there is like uh, six to seven people that very impressive. 
So, and it's a can challenge. Uh, we, we develop a technology which is IoT, as you know, that Internet of Things needs Internet. So, um, but in Cambodia, in province really hard to access with the internet. So, um, whatever we are challenged, uh, with this to make a data in, in one platform or going to cloud. So the things that we can do it right now is to using SMS gateway once, um, that we are testing in pilots and also with the internet as well in the summary that we can in, uh, access with internet. So we cannot, uh, use it in locally or uh, everywhere. It's can, uh, it's just like, some of areas that can um, access with internet and some areas that can access with SMS. So we are trying to think about simple ways that can help uh, the farmers or replace some activity by manually. So some farmers in rural area in very hard to connect with internet, we ensure the SMS one that can remote control on and offset the duration, timing, something like that, and see the history. But some area we can use the um, internet access. So we are trying to develop in, the, currently we are in developing states with the internet access it. And, and so that's it. Um, so the most things that we have to think is uh, using the technology, which is the simple one, fit with our situation, fit with our um, custom stand in Cambodia. So um, I think that accurate tech, is, it have to be mid time. It have to be commitment. It's 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 very uh, while while you change, it's connect together. So technology is a part. The right technology is very the main things to things, and the people using it, the end user, and then the uh, educate some part of that. So um, we are not really uh, not really provided the perfect solution, but we think that we are on the way on the perfect. So 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 that's it. We have to um, commitment on this one. Thank you. Thanks really from you for your answers. Uh, sadly, we're mm -hmm. running out of the time, but let me ask a final question to Jolene and uh, Shinka because I, I guess it's quite a hot topic about especially climate change. So for you, how tech is helping the agriculture sector reduce carbon emission? Who, who want to go first? Jolene? Yeah, no, I can go first. I think, I think that's a very broad question um, and tech comes in different forms. There's so much tech. There's hardware, there's software, there's, um, you know, IoT sensors, there's sort of giving people tech for training, there's people uh, doing tech to actually bring access to market. Uh, there are ways to actually use tech to grow in a more sustainable way. Um, and I feel as if there needs to be a combination of tech. Um, and ultimately, I feel as if when it comes to agriculture, it's still an industry that still needs to move from where it used to be um, to a point where it can adopt new technology. And ultimately, to adopt new technology for any kind of efficiency or more sustainability, you need it to make economic sense. Um, so I think that tech needs to be connected to the market and ultimately return higher returns to the farmer so that they're actually able to adopt technology. I think a lot of us think about technology as, okay, it's value creation. And then once the farmers adopt, they're able to do things better and become more sustainable. But the truth is farmers need to survive. Um, if you're not able to actually increase what makes their life easier and more profitable, that makes it difficult. So I think it's always about keeping in mind how do you value add and create value for both customers and farmers at the same time. And I think if you do that, then the form of the tech um, doesn't really matter. So long as your tech is able to actually bring more access um, and create value for both consumers, because we all eat from the farmers who farm for us, uh, but also for the farmers as well, and make it as easy as possible for them to adopt that tech. Because only when that happens, then you can think about how your tech's actually sort of uh, contributing to, to reducing climate change and making that better. I hope that helps. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Jolene. How about you, Chinka, as a final word? Um, I think just like for us, it's very important to start with the question if the uh, farmers are effectively using the natural resources now, like water uh, and soil, like how they are affecting it and how they can prevent some damages that to the soil and also the natural other natural resources, such as water, the very important one. So um, on our app, we are trying to integrate the GAP system, which is um, run by the UN FAO and also the Ministry of Agriculture in Mongolia. It's the good agriculture practice. Uh, so it's more uh, about like helping the farmers 
to more understand like how they can just prevent the climate change, how they can uh, reduce the carbon emissions. So those kind of systems, like the existing policies, very important to be integrated to the, the daily practice of the farmers today. So uh, that's the very initial stage. Uh, as Julian said, it's very a big topic and then it's uh, in the very long term. But at least right now, what we can do is like how we can just help them to use the natural resources. That's the most important point from my end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shinka. So thanks again to our guest speaker, Jolen, Srudin, and Shinka for this engaging conversation and also to all uh, participants and to our sponsor area, the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. See you mm -hmm. to our next virtual conference in partnership with area promoting gender equality and women empowerment on the 7th of October. Thanks all again and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.